All right, so uh, for today's talk, we are very pleased to have Chen Bai from the University of Maryland, and he is going to speak about post-quantum security of the even Mansour cipher. Uh, hi everyone, and thanks for introducing Carl. And hi everyone, I'm Chen, and today I'm happy to talk about our recent work and the uh, post quantum security of the Evan Mansour cipher. And this is a joint work with uh, Gorian Lajic, Johnson Kass, and uh, the Chris Margins. So, yeah, let me start with the, uh, the motivation. So, as we know, quantum computers will have a big impact in crypto, and the many commonly used crypto systems will be completely broken once large quantum computers exist. And in a symmetric crypto cryptography, which uses a public key to encrypt data and the private key to decrypt data. So for example, since Charles algorithm can solve the factoring problem in polynomial time and many asymmetric primitives such as RIC and Diffie Hellman, which rely on the hardness of such problem are totally insecure in the quantum world. And moreover, it seems feasible for a malicious attacker to simply store all encrypted data when it has access to a quantum computer. So switching to lattice-based and code-based schemes is also important. And besides the symmetric cryptography, the other main part of the cryptography is the symmetric crypto, which uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt data. So in the quantum world, the most common, uh, the most common quantum attack for symmetric primitives is based on the Grover's algorithm, which provides a quadratic speed up for searching on another database. So that leads to a very straightforward solution. You can just double the key lens to cover the quadratic speed up. But the question is, is this enough? Or is there like any, uh, does there exist any uh, unknown, like unknown clever quantum attacks? So recently, um, crypto scientists are making progresses on quantum attacks using superposition queries. And uh, actually, there are some attacks that requires only polynomial queries. Well, but all those attacks kind of require the quantum access to the key function, which is hard to achieve. So the question whether the symmetric crypto is safe in the quantum world is still quite open. There are some, a lot of gaps between the quantum world and the classic world. And to study this, the goal is to design a toolbox of symmetric cryptanalysis in a quantum setting in order to understand the security of symmetric algorithms against quantum adversaries. So first I want to talk about one key ingredient in the symmetric crypto, which is the block cipher. So yeah, a block cipher is just an encryption and decryption scheme which operates on blocks of data and basically just divide the blocks plain ties into those uh, several small blocks and just apply block cipher on each of them. And so that it can achieve the high computational speed and high speed computation. So here, this picture shows how the block cipher works on a single block and it has two parts, the encryption part and the decryption part. So block ciphers are like commonly used classically and there are many good block ciphers such as the uh, other ones encryption standard AES and also block ciphers are commonly used to provide the information service such as the confidentiality or authentication. So here, these are examples. And so apparently block ciphers are st well studied classically. So now the question is, are they secure against quantum adversaries? So like I said before, this part is like, haven't been studied a lot. And to study this, we naturally want to consider a uh, very important block cipher and with as simple construction as possible, right? So here comes the uh, Avamensor cipher. So Avamensor cipher is just a general approach for constructing a block cipher from a public random permutation. And, this, and here we show the definition and the sketch. So this is the minimum construction because the Avamensor cipher EKX is constructed from only one public permutation P and along with two XOR operations. And it has been proved that eliminating either one of the two XOR keys make it easy to re recover the other one. So you can't make it simpler. And also the Avamensor cipher is important because it is a key ingredient in many like symmetric key constructions and including some like needs to, uh, including some lightweight crypto systems presently under the consideration of standardization by needs. So such as the elephant and the chess key. And Elephant was, is actually one of the finalists. So right, so this is a quite useful and important cipher. And next, I want to talk about the quantum attack models in, in the symmetric crypto. And the quantum attacks can be mainly classified into two types. 
And the first one, the Q1 model, where attackers have access to a quantum computer to perform any offline computation, while they are only allowed to make classical online queries. So applying to the Evan Master cipher, so the adversary has classical access to the key uh, permutation EK and quantum access to the public permutation P. So which means the so adversary in the Q1 model can like talk with an honest user and ask the user to send the user a message and ask the user to in encrypt this message and then receive the cipher test and doing all this in a classical way. And at the meantime, so the adversary also has access to a quantum computer to make quantum queries on locally on the like the public permutation, public primitives P. Right. So that this is a Q1 model. And uh, and we sorry, we also have the Q2 model, and whereas the attackers have the access to quantum computer to perform any offline computation. So same offline quantum access, but they're allowed to make quantum queries to all oracles. So yes, yeah, so in the Evermaster cipher, so the adversary has quantum access to both EK and P. So which means the Q2 adversary can directly query the cryptographic oracle with a quantum superposition of classical input. So it can just send the user the send, send the like superposition query to the user and then receives the superposition of the corresponding outputs. So, right. So one important thing to note is that since P is a public permutation, so it, so it can be specific by some like publicly known circuits, which means it can be implemented locally by an adversary. So that's the reason why in both Q1 and Q2 models, so it's reasonable for an adversary to have quantum access to the public permutation P. Well, in contrast, EK involves a private key, so which is unknown, so the adversary doesn't know what exactly the the circuits of EK, right? So the only way for an adversary to get quantum access to EK would be if there exists a quantum interface to grant such access. So however, the, the key permutation is implemented between honest parties using a classical computer. So, right, so there's no way for such an honest party classical computer to expose a quantum interface. So that's why in this way, the Q1 model is much more realistic and reasonable. So Q2 model is hard to achieve and is not something we want, even in the quantum world. And next, I want to talk about the security of the Evan Mansur cipher. And suppose the adversary makes QE queries to EK and QP queries to P. So first, uh, the Evan Mansur cipher is classically secure. It's optimal attack QE times QP around 2N. So the proof was first given by Evan and Mansur and then later improved them, like evaluated by many others. And next is the, the Q2 model, where the adversary, like I said before, the adversary has classical access to EK and quantum access to P. So in this setting, the adversary can evaluate the unitary operators, UP and UE, on any quantum state it prepares. So unfortunately, it is totally insecure against a fully quantum attack with, the, with this success. So the reason is that, like, Intuitively speaking, like if you take a look at the FX, which is the EKX XRP, you can find that the FX has a hidden period K. So which 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 mean which leads to the solution that we can just use the apply the Simon's algorithm to give an attack using only polynomial queries. So that's the high level, so that's the high level idea of this attack. Uh, well, in the Q1 model, the security wasn't quite clear. So pre previously, Kuokado and Mori shows a key recovery attack, which requires only two to the n over three queries in total using the BHT collision finding algorithm. And the zero, the zero attack requires exponential memory, which was later input to polynomial memory in the offline Simon paper. And also there is a concurrent work which proves the security of F X construction, but against a, a restricted adversary. So we call this the non-adaptive adversary because this, this adversary only makes all the class queries first and then make after making all those class queries and then start making quantum queries. So, right. So, so whether the Evermaster, uh, so whether Evermaster cipher is secure in a general quantum post-quantum setting 
hasn't been answered yet. So our work answers this question and we prove the lower bound showing that to the NOR3 is unnecessary for attacking the Evan Master cipher in the Q1 model. All right, so next I will talk about our main result. So if you take a look at the equation on theorem one and on the left-hand side, where the diversity like has classical sets the first oracle EK and the quantum sets the second oracle, which is a public permutation P. So we call this a real world. And on the right-hand side, the diversity has classical sets to random permutation R and the quantum sets to P. So we call this the ideal world. So basically theorem one, wants to show that the real world and the ideal world are indistinguishable. So the virtual can't distinguish, or di distinguish whether it talks with uh, the elementary cipher or with the uh, random permutation. And right, and the bond actually implies for any attacker who wants to win, like win this game to distinguish the real world between the real world and the ideal world with constant success probability. So the virtual needs either QE squared times QP or QP squared times QE, at least two to the N. And that result actually like matches the bound with, and that like the BHT and the upline Simon algorithm provide. So, which means our, uh, which means like our, our bound is tight with, with respect to the number of queries. And also real world attackers are usually assumed to make far fewer queries to the key online primitive uh, EK than to the public offline primitive P. So suppose if EK is less, much less than Q, sorry, if QE is much less than QP, we can simplify the adversary's advantage to QP square root QE over two to the number two. And also our theorem works for an attacker who can adaptively choose how many queries she makes based on the outcome of intermediate measurements. So that's what we call the adaptive adversary. And also in our theorem, the adversary has both forward and inverse oracle access. And this talk, we will just like focus mainly on the forward case. Sometimes I'll just ignore the inverse case, but we have proved that the inverse case is entirely symmetric. So, all right, so next I want to talk about the two, essentially, two essential lemmas we need in our proof. And the first one is called the uh, resampling lemma. And uh, so this is a permutation of the previous work, which is called the tight adaptive reprogramming lemma and which works for the function case. So here we extend this lemma to the uh, two-way accessible permutation case. And so we start with the uniform permutation P and the two-phase distinguisher D. So the goal of the distinguisher is to determine whether the permutation was resampled at two points or not. So yeah, to see the resampling game, let's start with phase one, where the distinguisher just get quantum access to P. And after making Q0 quantum queries uh, to P and its inverse. So after making Q0 quantum queries, it outputs a state as T. So before the second phase, now the challenger samples a uniform bit little b and along with two uniform NB strings as zero and as one. And then the challenger construct a new permutation. So we call this a resampled permutation where basically it just swaps the value of P as zero and P as one. And then the challenger set P zero as the original permutation and P one as the resampled permutation. So, right, so with all those pre preparations, we have the phase two, where the distinguisher receives the quantum state along with uh, S0 and S1, and the distinguisher also gets quantum access to PB and its inverse. After making Q1 queries, it outputs a uh, gas B prime. So the distinguisher wins if B prime equal to B, which means that if the distinguisher guesses correctly whether it receives the original permutation or the reprogrammed permutation in the second phase. All right, so to, to analysis of the, uh, the distinguisher's advantage in this game, so one important to, to, to note is that the resampling values S0 and S1, and they're actually from the same distribution used to initially sample the outputs of P, which means the distribution won't change after resampling happens. So P0 and P1 actually have the same distribution. And therefore, so to win this game, the adversary has to query either S0 or S1. 
in the first phase before resampling happens. So that in the second phase, when it has access to PB, it can query as zero or as one, right? So if it gets same result, which means P equal to zero, and it got different result, which means P equal to one. So it can tell whether the permutation is resampled or not. So, well, but if the adversary didn't learn as zero or as one in the first phase, like didn't query as zero as one successfully in the first phase, and then in the second phase, no matter B equal to zero or B equal to one, the distinguisher just receive a random permutation with same distribution. And there's no way for such a distinguisher to determine whether the permutation was resampled or not. Even it has, even it knows as zero and as one, and it has like query access. So, right. So the probability that the adversary, so the distinguisher's advantage only depend on the Query is the phase one and it's independent from the query is the phase two. So with only cost success, the distinguisher needs to make to the n queries in the first phase. And our resampling lemma shows for any quantum distinguisher D to win this game with like constant probability, the distinguisher needs like to make at least square root to the n queries in the first phase. So there's at most a quadratic speed up. Right, so this is our resampling game. And the next, I want to talk about the arbitrary reprogramming lemma. So this is the generalized version of the blending lemma in the previous work. And here we extended the proof so that it works for an adaptive adversary. And this involves a three-phase distinguisher. And the goal of the distinguisher is to tell whether the function is reprogrammed or not. So we start with phase one, where here the distinguisher just outputs a description of a function f and a randomized algorithm script b. So if you run the algorithm script b with some certain randomness, then you get output the set capital B, where the each element in capital B is at most epsilon. So here, basically, the, the distinguisher knows exactly what the function is and can choose how the function will be reprogrammed based on the choice of the algorithm script B. So to see how it works, let's move on. So before the second phase, the, this, the challenger runs the samples of randomness R and runs the, the algorithm script B with R to get, a, to get a set capital B. And then it samples the uniform bit little b. So now similar as the uh, like resampling game and the challenger construct a new function FB where so each x in b is reprogrammed to y. And then the challenger set f0 as the original function and f1 as the uh, reprogrammed function. So now in the second phase, the, uh, the distinguisher receives a quantum access to uh, fb. And after making two queries, it outputs a state as t. Right, and since this is a uh, adaptive adversary, so Q is the expected number of quantum queries the distinguisher makes. And also when the distinguisher is done making queries in the phase three, it receives the randomness used to invoke the script B in phase two and along with the state. And now it can't make query any queries anymore. So it just output a guess B prime. So the distinguisher wins if B prime equal to B. Right, so intuitively speaking, since the distinguisher only knows uh, the randomness R at phase three, which means the distinguisher knows exactly what the set capital B is at phase three, but only after it is done making queries. So this won't help the adversary like learn what B is, right? So the only way that the adversary can tell whether the function was reprogrammed or, or not is by querying with significant amplitude on some points in set B at phase two, right? So it's like, it's because only phase two, it made queries. So with only classic access, the distinguisher needs to make one over epsilon queries because the probability of each element in capital B is at most epsilon. Well, our arbitrary reprogramming show, lemma shows for any quantum distinguisher D, there's also a, at most a quadratic speed up. 
And next, I want to talk about the proof technique that we use in our work. And to say, and then we'll see how we use those two lemmas. And uh, so our proof uses the uh, hybrid method. And as we have seen in the theorem one, so theorem one wants to prove that the real world and is close to the ideal world, right? So we set the real world as a, our first hybrid H0 and the ideal world as our very last hybrid HQE. So basically we want to prove that H0 is close to HQE. So the idea of hybrid matter is that we add many intermediate hybrids between the first and the last hybrid, and by making slightly changes, hybrid by hybrid, and then we prove that each change is relatively small. So here, H1, H2, and all the way to HQE minus one, all those are the intermediate hybrids, and uh, we need to prove that each intermediate hybrid is close to its pre previous one. So to say how it works, let's see. Let's start with uh, let's start with uh, our hybrid. So here is what our hybrid was the first hybrid look like, and here is what HQE looks like. So well, each E K or R indicates one classical query. Well, each P indicates multiple quantum queries in our setting, and without loss of generality, we suppose the classical queries are non-repeated. So basically here, our, our hybrid has QE stages and the stages are divided by the classical query. So, for, so each stage contains a classical query and followed by a bunch of quantum queries, right? And so, so right, in our setting, so the virtually can adaptively choose the number of quantum queries in each stage. So that's why we call, we said that our theorem works for an adaptive adversary. And so also after QE round, so, so this H0 has QE stages and after QE and after QE stages, it makes QE classical queries and QP quantum queries. Right, so since we have the H0 and the real world, and the ideal world HQE, so our goal is just to like make a, a theory of hybrids and from H0 to HQE and prove that and prove that each in each each hybrid we make small changes, and each and uh, since the dif only difference between H zero and H Q E is that all the classical queries are answered by R instead of E K. So uh, an immediate idea just to change E K to R step by step, right? So ideally, we want our this is our H1, where we just change the first EK to R and keep everything else unchanged. And if we construct H2 from H1, we just change the second EK to R. And if we keep making those changes, after QE round, we can just get our final, final hybrid HQE, right? And this seems very like reasonable and natural. And our next goal is just to prove that H0 is close to H1 and H1 is close to H2 and so on. But um, here comes a problem. So, right. So suppose, suppose uh, the adversary is like first classical input output pair is x1 and y1. So it, in the h0, y1 is equal to p x1 or k x or k, because based on the definition of the Abelmanser cipher. Well, in h1, x1 and y1 is just a random pair, right? Because r is a uniform permutation. So here comes a problem because if we suppose, if we imagine there exists an adversary who can later learn the key, like it can later break the Abelmanser cipher in the later rounds, then the adversary can just query X1, X or key to its like local compute, to its local quantum, quantum computer or just to the quantum oracle P, right? Then in H0, it can get output Y1, X or K, well, in H1, it gets some, it, it outputs some Y, which is like probably totally independent from Y1. So then the adversary can distinguish those two hybrid easily. So what I want to say is that if we want to prove that H0 is cl H close to H1 in this setting, we kind of already need the condition that Abelmanser is secure like the, the, the condition that the adversary couldn't learn the key in the later round. But that's def definitely what we, 
not what we want, right? Because we want to prove the security of the Evan Mansour, and we don't know it's secure or not until it, it, we prove it. So we can't just assume the security as a condition. So that's not what we want. And to overcome this problem, so we add one more intermediate hybrid in each round. So here, so which is uh, H prime here. So the classical setting of H zero prime is same as the H one before, right? Because all the first classical query is answered by random permutation R and all the rest classical queries are answered by EKP. And the difference is that all the quantum queries are answered by PT1K instead of P, where PT1K is given here, is given on the right, right side, where basically this is just a reprogrammed permutation where it's just like reprogrammed output of x1, x or k to y1, x or k. And, and this solves the problem we had before because now even when the adversary can break the Evan Mansour and learn the key in the later round, then and then and then the adversary query x1, x or k to the p oracle. And then in both h0 and h0 prime, it will get y1, x or k. So h0 and the, in the adversary's view, so the H0 and H0 prime perform identically. And then we are able to prove that H, the change we made from H0 to H0 prime is relatively small. And also the only difference between H0 prime and H1 is that the first quantum query is answered by PT1K instead of P. So we are also able to prove that this change is also small. So yeah, that's a high level idea of our hybrid method and, and how it works in the first round. And if we continue doing that, we get, we get H1 prime, H2, uh, H2 and so on. And then we can extend our work to the general case where in the J's round, where we have the HJ and HJ prime. So here for in HJ in the first, J stages, all the classical queries are answered by R and all the quantum queries are answered by P. And for the rest stages, all the classical queries are answered by EK and all the quantum queries are answered by PTJK, where TJ stores all the input and output pairs on R. And PTJK is just a corresponding um, permutation where you swap, you, you reprogram every P, X, X, or K to Y, X, or K. So this is the idea is just like how we constructed P, T, 1, K. And we also have the H, G prime where we change the G plus one's classical query to R and all the rest quantum queries to P, T, G, T, G plus one K. And right, so our goal is just to prove that big J is close to the H, G prime. And so here we use the resampling lemma to prove that they are closed and the, and the the general proof idea is just to is just to construct a resampling game, and where the b equal to zero case correspond to the h j, and b equal to one case correspond to the h j prime. So, and uh, so we prove that for every j, h j is close to h j prime, and the upper bound has two parts. The first one is a resampling lemma. And the second part is uh, some bad events we encounter, right? So this is a proof idea, right? Let a be. so if we suppose a distinguisher between H J and H J prime, and we construct the distinguished D for the resampling game. So when B equal to zero, the output of the adversary is identically distributed to H J, and when B equal to one, the output of A is identically distributed to H J prime. Right. And also for, we also have the corresponding HJ prime and HJ plus one. And to, to prove that HJ prime is close to HJ plus one. So we use the, the arbitrary reprogramming game. And this is our the proof idea. So similarly as before, let A be a distinguisher between those two hybrids. And we construct the distinguisher D for the arbitrary reprogramming game. So when B equals to zero, it corresponds to the HJ plus one case. And when B equals to one, it corresponds to the HJ prime case. And we are able to prove for every J, 
hj and is close to hj plus one. And the upper bound comes from the arbitrary programming lemma. So if we combine those two lemmas together, we can prove for every j, hj is close to hj plus one. And if we add up all those results from j equal to zero to qe minus one, we can finally prove that h1 is close to hqe, uh, sorry, h0 is close to hqe. So the, and right, the bound is, is exactly what we got in the, in our main theorem, in theorem one, right. So, right, this is a high level idea of our like hybrid method and the like oversimplified version of the proof. And uh, next, I want to talk about a few more things about our work. So we also prove the security of the forward only Evan Mansour where the, uh, uh, the public permutation P is replaced with a public function F and there's only one XOR operations involved, which is inside the function. So we have EKX equal to F X XOR K. And uh, something to note is that here the adversary can only make forward queries because when it make inverse queries, this is easily broken. And also we prove the security in the Q1 model where the adversary has classical access to EK and quantum access to F. So, right, our theorem four shows that this, this is secure. So far, we only have a mensor secure in the Q1 model. And the bond is actually like tighter than before and the proof is actually easier because the adversary only has forward access. And the next thing I want to talk about is a hidden shift problem. And this is a very famous problem. So the goal of the hidden shift problem is just to find an unknown shift S by querying an oracle for a function F on the group of G or the oracle for the shifted function FSX. And if both oracles are classical, it has been proved that this, pro this problem has query complexity super polynomial in log set J. And if both oracles are quantum, so the query complexity is polynomial, it also has been proved. And, but the algorithmic difficulty appears to depend critically on the structure of J. So what I, the main thing I want to say is that our work implies two variants of the hidden shift problem. And the first one is a one-sided hidden shift where the oracle for F is quantum, while the oracle for FS is classical. And the second one is a two-sided hidden shift. Instead of having one unknown shift S, we have S1 and S2 here. And if F is a permutation, we also grant the uh, inverse success. And our theorem two shows that the hidden shift problem is hard, like in both case, in both the one-sided and two-sided case cases, right? And so to prove the one set. The so one-sided hidden shift is hard, and uh, the the proof follows of the uh, and the, pro the proof follows from the proof of the forward only Avamanser cipher, and the proof of the two-sided hidden shift problem follows from the proof of like our our main theorem that about the like like two-sided Avamanser. Right, so there are also some future works that we want to consider. And the first one is uh, attacker's advantage. So our, our theorem one shows the adversary's advantage, like QP root QE over to the N over two. Well, both BHT and offline Simon algorithm achieves a better advantage, which is QP square QE root over to the N over two. So which means our theorem is tight with respect to the queries, the number of queries, but it's not tight with respect to the attacker's advantage. So reducing the gap would be a very interesting question. And next is uh, like, since, uh, since I've mentioned, the previous work showed the security of the FS construction in the Q1 model, but with a restricted adversary. That adversary can only make classical, classical queries first and then quantum queries. So here we want to break this restraint and we want to prove the security of uh, FS construction in the Q1 model with a more general diversity, like uh, adaptive diversity using our work. So to, 
So to work on that, we have to consider an ideal cipher model where E, where the ideal cipher E is a function with two inputs, a key and a message. And so each K correspond to a permutation. And so the corresponding fx is that is shown here. So it has two, it has two k. The the the, the one key one key is called the uh, the cipher key, and another key one is called the fx key. So right. So this this fx construction is similar as the Abelmanser construction as I've shown before. Right. The only difference that is replace the public permutation p we see uh, ideal cipher EK. So, right, proving that our theorem works for this ideal cipher case is also very important and very interesting. And um, for sure, we can also apply our result to some like symmetric constructions which based on the EM, have a mansor, uh, so such as Chesky and the elephant. So proving the post-quantum security of the Chesky and Elephant in the Q1 model is also, yeah, very interesting and something that uh, we're planning to do. Right, so yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks everyone for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the video.